twice, I've got overexcited with the clicker and I've, I've clicked the clicker to start, which is of course not how you start a talk. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Holly Cummins. I'm from the IBM Cloud Garage. We're, um, we're like a startup within IBM. We're a consultancy organization. So our mission is to write cloud native applications using lean startup, extreme programming, design thinking. And because we're, we're writing cloud native applications, or at least we, we ourselves think we're writing cloud na native applications, I'm sometimes surprised by some of the other definitions of cloud native that I see, because I think, well, that doesn't seem anything like what I do for my job, but I'm pretty sure that I'm writing cloud native applications. And I see the opposite as well sometimes, where I, I see clients who, who say, well, we're, right, we're doing cloud native, and I look and I think, I'm pretty sure you're not doing cloud native. That, that doesn't seem like the definition of, of cloud native that, that I have um, in my head. Um, and I should say as well that the IBM Cloud Garage is hiring. Um, so we've, we've got 14 garages worldwide, including Copenhagen and Munich, both of which um, are somewhat local to, to here. Um, so if, if you think that the Cloud Garage might be a place for you, um, then, then please do reach out. Um, but to, to start with, how many of you would say that you're doing cloud native development? One hand, two hands, three hands. OK, how many of you would like to be doing cloud native development? OK, more hands. That, that's good. If there hadn't been any hands for the second question either, I would have been quite concerned. And there might have been some of you who found this talk not especially relevant. Um, and I think one of the one of the sort of the first things with cloud native is, well, what even is it? Because the, I noticed last year I was at a conference and I was walking around the, the vendor space and every single booth pretty much said cloud native, you know, our, our software, here's our new product for cloud native, you know, here's how we support cloud native. And it was sort of, it was becoming a bit one of those overused words, you know, like agile or something where it stops to have meaning because everybody has to say they're doing it and nobody can really quite figure out what it is or, or you know, whether they're actually doing it. Um, and what, what made me really start to think about the, the definition of cloud native, I should say as well, um, I consider this to be one of my great achievements, and it's one of those achievements, it was a bit, um, how many of you were in the previous talk? A couple of hands, yeah, actually, cool. Um, so in the previous talk, I was talking about fun, and I had a picture of a mushroom because a mushroom is a fun guy, and then I think that is the most awesome joke in the world. Um, I've given that talk many times. Each time, <laughs> each time, everybody in the audience has looked, and a couple of people have walked out. Um, so, so this is my so the fun guy joke is my greatest achievement. This is my second greatest achievement, which is that when you have something that's a bit unclear in its definition and it can mean different things to different people, then what you really need is a mascot. So this I haven't named it yet, but this is the cloud native mascot. So you can see it's in the cloud and it sort of you know looks a little bit you know nativey, um, little little Martian cloudy thing. Um, and that is what, so if, if anybody says, you know, what is cloud native, you can say, oh, well, it could be this or it could be that, but as long as it's got a cloud and, you know, like a little mascot in the cloud, then it's cool, we're cloud native. It hasn't taken off yet, but some, someday, someday we'll all be looking at, you know, the cloud native mascot. Um, but what, what made me really think about cloud native and decided that I needed to draw a cloud native mascot um, was I saw this tweet from Daniel Bryant, um, who was here earlier speaking. Um, and he said, oh, look, I think this is a really great definition of cloud native from, from Bill Ganibrium. And of course, you, you cannot see that. Um, but here's the picture larger. And so what it ha ha has is it has SOA is what we used to do. And then microservices is what we used to do last year. And cloud native is what we're doing now. And it sort of presented it as this progression of service orientation. So with SOA, we had smart pipes and dumb endpoints. With microservices, we've got smart endpoints and dumb pipes. And then with the cloud native, we've got smart platform and dumb services. I'm kind of thinking, that just doesn't seem like a definition of cloud native that has any relevance to me in what I do and what I consider to be cloud native. Um, and yet, Daniel Bryant's a really smart guy. Bill um, Gnabry, really smart guy. So what's going on? Well, if you go read the, the article, um, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, because that, 
picture had come out without any context. So it was just, this is what cloud native is, it's a successor to microservices. Um, but the article is actually about microservices in a post-Kubernetes era. So of course, if you're talking about microservices, and the whole article title is about microservices, then it makes sense that you're going to talk about cloud native as a form of microservices or as an extension to microservices. Um, so I felt a little bit better after working that out, but I still felt pretty uneasy because, of course, it's not just Bill Gnibriam who, who has this definition of cloud, say, cloud native as quite a lot like microservices. If you look at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation webpage, again, you, know, you, you probably can't read that, um, but they call out a few things. So they say cloud native is microservices, containers, and dynamically orchestrated. And so, and that still, it just doesn't feel quite right to me. Um, but then that puts me in a really awkward position, you know, because here's little me, I know a few things, but you know, I'm standing up here and I'm saying, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, what do they know about Cloud Native, right? So that's sort of an awkward position to be in because I'm pretty sure they know a lot about Cloud Native. Um, and, and I should be fair as well. So they, they sort of call out these technical characteristics, which is the microservices, the dynamically orchestrated. Um, but then they do have, at the end of that sentence, they have a why. And the why is to build great products faster. But I think that is actually the most important part of cloud native. It's not what technologies we're using. It's why we're using them. What are our goals? So let's, let's think about why. Um, and another way of phrasing that is what problem <coughs> are we trying to solve? You know, why, why, what's wrong with how we were doing things so that we need to start doing this cloud native? And I should say as well, there's a problem that we shouldn't be trying to solve, which is this one. The problem that we should not be trying to solve when we go to cloud native should not be, my CV looks really dull. I need more Kubernetes on my CV so that I can get hired, right? Like that's, that's just not a good reason to be making these technical choices. And it's sort of, it's good to, in order to understand why we needed cloud native and what problem cloud native were try, was trying to solve, it's good to step back and think, well, what, what problem was cloud trying to solve anyway? You know, it's sort of ancient history now, but why, why cloud? Well, when we went to cloud <clears throat> back in, in the mists of time, the first thing that businesses were trying to solve was a cost problem. They said, I've got all these data centers. I have to pay a ton of money in electricity. I have to pay a ton of money in staff to keep these things patched and maintained. And yet I actually only need a small portion of the capacity. I know other organizations could do it more efficiently than I could. And in fact, I only need the capacity at like Black Friday or Christmas or that kind of thing. And so that, that requirement to have more, they, to, to not need to have so much capacity sitting in your own local data center is actually an elasticity requirement. So we started thinking about cost, and the real way to make the cost savings was by having the elasticity. So we only used the capacity that we actually needed. But then we saw another big benefit of cloud, which was speed. Um, and so what I mean by this is speed to market. So we want to be faster to market because if we're faster to market, that means we can respond to new business opportunities. It means we can respond to our customers. Uh, you know, it, it's going to be way better to ship software by cloud than it is to do what we used to do, which is, you know, we've got the CD pressing center in Dublin. And when we had a release boundary, we'd like send, you know, the zip over to them and they'd actually be printing loads of CDs and mailing it to our customers. You know, that, that was really slow. Cloud allows us to be faster. Um, and there is another speed aspect to cloud, actually, um, which is that cloud hardware is often much faster than we have, can have in our own data center. Um, and that's partly because, you know, you can pay for it and they can keep it up to date and that kind of thing. Um, but also there's a lot of exotic capabilities that you can get in the cloud that you just can't get locally. So some of that is stuff like GPUs. Um, so with GPUs, you know, you could make a huge GPU estate locally, but are you really going to do it? Probably not. Much better to use someone else's. Um, and s GPUs you could do locally. Some other capacity, some other um, hardware things you really couldn't do locally. So now we're starting to see. Um, Roy mentioned yesterday that IBM has quantum computers in the cloud, and we were the first to put quantum computers in the cloud. And and that's 
that's really cool. And that's something that, like, with no matter how much you work at it, you know, you're not going to have a quantum computer in your own data center because it needs to be kept at 0.4 Kelvin, which is colder than the space between the stars, and you don't want to be doing that kind of refrigeration in your data center, and quantum computers are really expensive. You know, so you're just not going to have a quantum computer in the data center, but you can go use a quantum computer on the cloud. So that all sounds great, right? So we've got lower cost, we've got more elasticity, we've got faster speed to market, and then we've got all this cool hardware, like the, you know, the GPUs and the quantum computers and, and, and everything like that. Um, so what's the problem? Why do we need to go on to cloud native? Well, it turns out when we, when we started thinking about cloud, uh, we used this metaphor of electricity and we said, Nobody's, you know, now having a generator in their data center. You know, you, you bring the electricity in. And it's a bit the same with the cloud. You know, we, this is just a utility. We don't need to be providing it ourselves. We can go to a utility company and they can bring our, 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 um, our hardware to us. But what happened is that we discovered that the cloud was a little bit like electricity. Um, and a lot of us got electrocuted. So these, we discovered when we tried to move our applications to the cloud, that this didn't work and this didn't work and storage ended up being really hard and, and you know, all sorts of things that had worked great locally were horrible in the cloud. So we started to think about the patterns that we needed to be doing in order to not get electrocuted on the cloud. And so one of the first articulations of these patterns was the 12 factors and we started thinking about 12 factor applications. Um, some people say, oh, the 12 factors aren't really quite right because they, were, they, they came from Heroku and they were really what you need to run an application successfully on the Heroku cloud, not necessarily a more universal thing. Um, but you can quibble about the details, but really the cloud, the, the 12 factors are a really good explanation of how to write a cloud application so you don't get electrocuted. Um, and they cover a lot of things that had seemed like really good ideas and were no longer. So it used to be that the best practice was to write all of your logs to a file and you would do a lot of things about the file naming and the file rotation and all this kind of stuff. And in the cloud, that really doesn't work at all because when, when, um, when your instance disappears, you lose all the logs. So instead, you need to be writing your logs to standard out, and you need to be having something picking up standard out and, and putting them somewhere that survives the, the demise of the machine. And, you know, there's more. But I think what's really important about the 12 factors is they don't mention microservices anywhere. And I think, to me, the 12 factor application seems like a much better definition of cloud native um, than microservices. And really, if cloud native has to be a synonym for anything, uh, it should be idempotent. So, you know, your application has to, if you take your application down and you bring it up again and then you take it down, it has to be behave in a sensible way each of those times, you know, so there's idempotency on restart and idempotency on, on various other things. Um, item potency isn't much fun to say. Um, it's not much fun for me as a native English speaker to say. Um, so I imagine if you're a non-native speaker, it's even less fun. So item potent definitely needs a synonym. Let's all agree cloud native is a synonym for that. Um, so what about containers? Well, containers are really good. So, you know, I've been talking about all of these things that aren't to do with containers, but containers are an awesome base for the cloud. They give you all sorts of great characteristics in terms of um, portability, in terms of light footprint. Those are really good. But the key thing with containers is it's not a competition to see how many you can have. It's not like if I've got my application and it's got three containers, I'm doing pretty well. But if I've got an application and it's got 16 containers, I'm doing great. And if I can work in 600 containers, then for sure anybody will hire me. You know, it, it, they have their place, but the having lots of containers does cause some problems as well. And so if you don't need lots of containers, then you shouldn't feel obliged to have lots of containers. You know, there's this sort of technical fear of missing out again, where we sort of think, we look at what other companies are doing and we say, well, they're doing that, so I should do that. But sometimes their problem is a different problem. And so in particular, I would say that containers are really good, but you don't need the different components of your application to be communicating by HTTP to count yourself as cloud native. That's not the definition of cloud native to me. So does anybody know the story of the Russian space pencil? Yeah, about, about half the hands. Um, so the, the, Russia, the story is 
um, that when they, when they first started doing space exploration, they realized pretty quickly that a pen doesn't work in space because um, a pen needs gravity to push the ink down and there is no gravity in space, so the pen doesn't work. So the story is that NASA spent millions developing a pen that would write in space and the Russians used a pencil. And so the, the moral of the story is that this complexity that they introduced by insisting on using pens in space when pencils would do perfectly well added all of this expense. And because that complexity was actually totally unnecessary, all of that expense was unnecessary, it was just waste. It turns out, actually, the story's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and pretty much every part of that story that I said um, was wrong. So the first thing is that actually, both NASA and the Russians started out using pencils in space. Um, and the, the, but NASA had a problem, because for reasons that I never did quite work out, um, they ordered these special space pencils. And these special pace, space pencils cost like $130 each, which in the 60s was a huge, huge sum of money. So there was a, a big scandal, and everybody went, why is NASA wasting our money on $130 space pencils? So the space pen was developed, but NASA <coughs> didn't actually pay for the development of the space pen because they weren't going to pay for the development of anything expensive to do with writing because they'd been really burnt. Um, <coughs> but the company, so it was um, a company called the Fisher Space Pens who developed the uh, space pens. And the funny thing is they spent about a million dollars developing it, but the, the cost to buy was actually really small. It was about $2 per, per pen. So the first thing that was, that was wrong about the previous story was that the pens were actually way cheaper than the, the pencils. But there's another aspect that's wrong, um, which is that it turns out that pencils in space are a really bad idea. Because if you think about writing with a pencil, what happens is you leave a tiny little trail of graphite um, on the paper. So most of it's stuck to the paper. Some of it isn't stuck to the paper, but you don't really notice it because it just stays on the paper. Um, if you're in space, that little bit of graphite doesn't stay on the paper. It sort of floats up. And then in particular as well, if you break the nib of the pencil, then you've got a big bit of graphite that doesn't stay on the paper that starts floating around. And then of course, if you're in space and you've got particles floating around, then you could breathe them, one of you could get them in the eye. So then you have this problem that actually pen space pencils are totally dangerous. Um, and there's another aspect as well, which is that graphite is really flammable. And so flammable things in space, NASA tries to avoid. So the story is more complicated and, and the space pen was actually a better idea. So in that case, that was necessary complexity because it was solving a real problem. So it's not that simple as always better, it's just think about, well, what problem am I really trying to solve? So going back to cloud native, um, we first started, to, the, the cloud native really sort of started to be a thing in about 2010. Um, when Paul Freeman, there was a couple of people who sort of started talking about it at the same time. Um, but. Paul Fremantle started talking about it. And the, the definition he had, um, it was really very much about what I talked about, about these things that you need to not do in order to not get burnt in space. Um, and so he, in particular, he didn't talk about microservices because nobody was talking about microservices until you know much, much later. Um, he, he didn't talk about Docker because Docker wasn't, you know, wouldn't be invented until 2013, and this was 2011. And so he certainly didn't talk about Kubernetes for the same reason, you know, it was a ways off. And so the, the definition that he had was nothing to do with these technologies like Docker microservices. The definition he had was that it behaves well on the cloud. And what he said, which I think is true, and this is where cloud native comes from, is that in order to behave well on the cloud, experience shows it has to be written for the cloud. So it has to be written with the cloud in mind. So where do containers come in? What do containers give us? Why, why should they be in cloud native or, or not cloud native? Well, containers is actually a bit of a, a point on a spectrum of virtualization. Cloud definitely needs that virtualization, and, and probably it needs the, the at least the container level of virtualization. So at one end, on the left-hand side, we've got bare metal. Bare metal is not very cloudy, um, 
so soft layer, you can get a bare metal thing on the, on the cloud, um, but that's certainly not the, the normal model. The normal model is that you're going to have virtual machines. So you're going to have one piece of hardware, you're going to have multiple virtual machines. Virtual machines are still pretty expensive in terms of their overhead. Um, so we, we prefer, quite rightly, containers, which allow you to have multiple lightweight things isolated from each other inside the same virtual machine. Containers are starting to feel a little bit old-fashioned as well now, um, because of course the cool new thing is functions and serverless. So you know, I don't even want the overhead of a container. I just want to have my little function and have that be the deployable unit, have that be the, the isolated thing. Sometimes the, the container people and the um, function people get a little bit hostile towards each other, and you you know you get the, the little fights, um, but they're actually. Sometimes when we talk about containers, we mean any kind of isolation that's not a virtual machine, so then we include functions. Sometimes we don't. It all gets a, a bit complicated. Um, and containers as well gets a bit complicated. So container used to mean just Docker. Um, now it mean, mean, means sort of a, a broader category of, of technologies like that. Um, containers are also much older than Docker as a concept. The, the Linux containers dated way back before. Um, and in things like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry has a container, which is the Warden container, and that, even though it's not Docker, is a, a perfectly good container. But going back to, to the functions, um, we start to see a, a hybrid model between function and containers. Um, and so that is called Funtainers. Um, and the reason for the name, it, it's not because it's fun. Um, it's because if you take function and containers, and then you sort of do the portmanteau between the two, and then you sort of merge it, then you get Funtainers. So what what um, Funtainers are is, as I said, that sort of it's it is a container, but it's deployable like a function. Uh, I don't think the technology is going to take off, and the reason for this isn't because it's not a good idea or because it's not adding anything technically. It's because I read an article about Funtainers and I thought, oh yes, I'd like to know more about this. I'm going to go Google for it, and so for two pages. I got nothing but this, which is the thermos funtainer. And so no technology can take off if it's not Googleable, right? So funtainer, good concept, great name. Unfortunately, such a good name, someone else already has it. Um, and obviously, with the thermos funtainer, they were thinking about fun, not functions. Uh, but with funtainers, I think there is that element as well, because I like to think of funtainers as all of the fun of containers, but without having to worry about Kubernetes, right? So you just sort of, you know, you push it and go, and it takes care of all of that stuff in a really easy way. But all of this, like funtainers, containers, virtualization, containers, all of that, it's about how we run our application, not what's in it. And I think really we should be thinking about what's in it. Why is this application here? What value is it giving to anybody? And that's, that's again, you know, where we start to think about the, the value of the cloud and the reason for the cloud, which is the speed. So the cloud gives us all the speed because we don't have to print CDs anymore. But what's the point of having this speed if we're just delivering the same old stuff as we used to do? Uh, what's the point of getting the same old stuff to market, market faster? Um, I'm, I'm reading the, um, the Accelerate book, and what they talk about this as well. They sort of, they say we have these architectural characteristics, and then we have the architectural technology. So microservices is a technology, but there's no point having microservices if your characteristics in terms of coupling are actually exactly the same as they were on the mainframe. Um, and you know, there's no point in being able to respond to the market if you actually don't respond to the market. There's no point of having an architecture that can go faster if you're not actually going faster. So this leads me to what can go wrong with cloud native. So here we have the, the, the cloud native mascot going, going wrong. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm a consultant. I work with lots of different companies. Um, some of these things you may be sitting and thinking, well, that sounds terrible. I would never do that. Nobody I know would ever do that. Is this real? Well, this, these are real customer quotes. Um, they're, and, and it's easy as well. You know, it, it's easy to get into these situations, and it, it's easy to, to find that you have good intentions and then something doesn't quite, quite work out. Um, 
so I went went into um, a project, and they had they were using microservices as as they should, um, but they they had quite a complex domain model. So it had about 20, 20, um, 20 different classes. Each class had about you know seventy fields. So it was this huge domain model. And each microservice needed to use that same domain model. And they said, oh, well, we know that we shouldn't have a dependency and a coupling to a shared library for, or, you know, for this um, domain model. So instead, we'll cut and paste the code between all of these microservices. And so this was not good. So the, the sort of the microservices dream, right, is that you have your microservices, and then you have your domain model, and there's a pretty close mapping between them. Your domain boundaries match to your microservices boundaries. But what had happened in this case was that their domain model, each microservice needed to use the exact same domain model, and they, so there's this mapping, you know, where, well, there wasn't the mapping, everything used the same domain model. And so that led, fairly predictably, to a problem, which is that at pretty much every single time they changed code, something broke in one of the other microservices. Because even though everything was in microservices and communicating by HTTP, it was really, really closely coupled because of this domain model that was the same in all of them. So they thought they had microservices, but what they actually had was the classic distributed monolith. Um, I like to visualize the distributed monolith as this, uh, which is that you take spaghetti, you move it up into the cloud, and you feel really good about yourself, and then you realize that actually you've just made it way, way worse. And now you have a fiery tornado made out of spaghetti firing meatballs at innocent customers. Um, so this is, this is not a good idea. And, you know, just to, to reiterate, just because a system runs across six different containers doesn't mean it's decoupled. It just means that it's much harder to debug your cu coupling and it's much harder to, you know, to discover that coupling because you've replaced your compile time checking with, in the worst case, no checking. So this is the Mars Space Explorer, um, which was uh, a famous and rather sad space exploration story. Um, so this isn't, I can't draw well enough to draw space explorers. So here's, um, here's a better photo of it. And there's a couple of things that I love about this. One is that, um, if you look, you can see it really looks like it's made out of a tumble dryer, a bin bag, and some sellotape. So, like those those tubes there, they look. I'm sure I've got one in the back of the same um, in the back of my tumble dryer, and like those little things that are sticking the silver bit to the frame. I swear those are, are sellotape. Um, so it, it didn't have a happy end, but it wasn't because it was made out of sellotape and tumble dryer. Um, what happened to it was that it just crashed into Mars. So can anybody remember why? Yeah, exactly. The, the problem was the units. So we had a system, the, the Explorer itself used metrics units, and it had a system in sp on the ground that was responsible for, for controlling it and sending occasional course corrections. That system used imperial units. So in this case, we had a distributed system, <laughs> but Distributing it didn't help, right? Like, that distribution didn't do anything to solve the problem. Um, and the problem was about a, contra a contract problem. There was a mismatch in the contract between what the explorer expected and what the, un the station on the ground expected. And, so, and there was no, no testing of that contract, and so then it crashed into Mars. And so really, with microservices, you've got to have consumer-driven contract tests. You've got to be making sure that these things are going to work together if you're going to have any chance of them being independently deployable. And this leads to the next problem that we often see, which is one of testing, which is we might have tests, but they're not automated. And another way of saying that, really, is we have no idea whether our code actually works. Um, and inevitably, if that's the case, then what that actually means is our code probably doesn't work for at least some things. Because the thing is, systems are going to behave in unexpected ways. You know, there are going to be surprises. And even if everything that we code is the most amazing things ever, well, then other things are going to go wrong, right? You know, our libraries, their documentation is going to be wrong. Uh, we might get a dependency update. That might change the behavior of a dependency in an unexpected way. And so then we're going to get bugs. 
And this was really, uh, testing was a core issue with the Mars Explorer. So they said, had we done end-to-end -end testing, we believe this error would have caught. You know, they did this sort of the post-mortem, and that was, they said, yeah, it was a bit of a shame. We didn't really test it properly, and then we sent it into space, and then we were surprised that it crashed into Mars. And this, this lack of testing leads to, to problems, because often what will, what will be done is instead of testing all the way through, we'll have a test phase at the end. And the business will say, we can't ship until we have confidence in the quality. And that means that the manual test phase, and we can't afford to be doing manual testing continuously because it's too expensive, because it's manual. So we have to have it backloaded, and then it has to be a separate phase. And then that means that we can't ship. So we're sort of, you know, the cloud gives us this dream that we could ship at any time, but actually we can't ship because we don't know if our product works. And with microservices in particular, because the odds are that these microservices aren't going to work together, or, or they might evolve in, in ways that mean that they no longer work together, you've got to have automated integration tests. And you've got to be saying, do these things still work together? Are they independently deployable? Have I broken any of my dependencies? And of course, we, once you automate the tests, then sometimes we see a second problem, which is that the tests are running, and they're broken, and nobody knows. So I, I, what, what I sometimes see happen, which is really not a good way of doing it, is that when the build breaks, nobody notices except for one person who sort of goes and looks at the build out of good citizenship, and then they realize that the build is broken, and so then they go and they tell off their colleagues and say, oh, did you know, Bobby, you broke the build? Well, that doesn't work. You know, it, it shouldn't be relying on people to actually remember to go and check the build to discover the build is broken. It has to be you know, something that's passive, that's always there, so you know, a traffic light system it seems you know, that, that works. That's probably only reliable if you've got one build. Um, so if you've got more builds, then you need maybe something like a build radiator that just shows your status. And there's another thing that you've got to do with these as well, which is sometimes we'll have a build radiator, but then we get a problem where something's red and it stays red, and then we get used to it being red, and we forget that it was ever really supposed to be green, and it's someone else's problem to fix it, I'm sure. And then you get this broken windows where people aren't sensitive to the red anymore. So I've, I've come into to projects and I've, I've looked at the build and I've said, hmm, this build is broken. And they've said, hmm, yeah, that build's been broken for a few weeks. And I was like, but if the build's broken for a few weeks, we've got to fix it. And because and, otherwise we sort of get accustomed to these systems being broken and they, they don't have their purpose anymore. It's not a check and balance anymore. And sometimes in the worst case, we even bypass that system because we know the build's not reliable. Um, so this is a lesson in how to lose your job if you work for the Russian Space Agency. Um, so this is Phobos, Phobos 1. Um, in about 1988, it was a, a Russian space probe, and they needed to make an update to it. And it was a really small update. And they, they, they had some automated tests, and, and in particular, they had an automated linting. But the system was broken. There was some problem with it. And, and, you know, the engineer wanted to make an update. So he said, well, the automated tests aren't working, so I'll just bypass them. And I'll just do, send my code update directly to space. And unfortunately, he had a problem which was um, he had an extra hyphen in his code. And the effect of that extra hyphen was to change an instruction sequence from the one he wanted to the one that said, take your fins and stop following the sun, which meant that within about two days, the solar charging on the fins stopped working and the whole space probe ran out of power. And so then once it ran out of power, there was no command that they could send it to recover it. So basically this whole thing was completely bricked. So rather sad. Lesson learned, do not automate your, bypass your automated checks, make them work, because otherwise, someday, you'll bypass them when they would have caught something. We see another problem as well, which is, which is that, you know, we've got the rigor, but it's the wrong kind of rigor, and it's the, the wrong time. Um, so I was working on a project, and, um, and we shipped it, and it was out with the users, and they were using it, and everybody was happy, and then they emailed me to say, oh, and we've scheduled the architecture review board. And they said, but, but it's shipped, it, it's written, you know. We, we should be talking about the architecture at the beginning if we're going to talk about it, and we did talk about it. So 
why after this is in the field are we going to do the architecture review board? Um, and so the, it, it was sort of, there was two speed IT, but it was all in the same project. So we had sort of a, a cloud process, but then we also had the old fashioned process that we hadn't been able to get rid of, even though it wasn't adding any value. So it was just this waste. Um, and, and we see this a lot where the processes take a long time to catch up. So the technology is there, but the process isn't. Um, so with, with the Mars Explorer, um, they could actually tell, because this, ha this it was sort of, you know, in, in, um, in its travels for quite a long time, and they, they were making, the navigators were making continual course corrections. And they could see that it didn't quite seem, they expected some errors, but the error that they could see was just bigger, and so they, they could see that something was wrong, and they said, look, something's wrong. But there was a process for reporting that something was wrong. And the process was to fill in a form. And because the navigators didn't fill in the right form, nothing was done, and they lost the explorer. So in this case, you know, they had, they had this process, but it wasn't adding value, because instead of catching problems, the process was actually stopping problems from being caught. So I, I really like extreme programming. I think that's the right kind of rigor. I think it's a kind of, you know, it, it predates the cloud, um, but it's the kind of rigor that is suitable for the cloud. You know, so we've got the test-driven development in order to make sure that we're having that quality feedback all of the time. We've got the pair programming. So instead of having code reviews, which are unlikely to catch major problems realistically um, because of, of, you know, human nature and that kind of thing, um, We've got the code, the, the pair programming, and in general, the whole thing is optimized for feedback. So that means that we've got these feedback cycles as small as possible, so that when we, when we try and figure out whether things are working or not, we learn early, and so then that means we can release often, because we've got, the, we've got the, the, you know, the quality in place. Another problem that we see has to do with getting the feedback, but not actually acting on it. Um, so quite often, we, we have a product design, and then we realize that there's something that doesn't make sense to do. But sometimes, because it was in the plan, we all continue doing it. So we, we've got this feedback. We learn now that our plan wasn't quite right, but we're not willing to do it because, or not willing to not do it because it was in the plan. And you know, maybe there was a contract in place that said it will have this feature. So even though we know this feature is no good, we continue doing it. We see a similar thing where something isn't in the plan, we then realize as we start working on it that it would be a great thing to have, but because it's not in the plan, it's too expensive to add it. So this, of course, is the Titanic. Um, when we think about the Titanic in a microservices context, which maybe isn't that often, um, but when we do, of course, the thing that we think about with the Titanic is the bulkhead. So the Titanic is super famous for having bulkheads. Um, and the bulkheads were supposed to stop it from sinking. Uh, what actually happened was that the, the bulkheads didn't stop it because they'd, when they designed the bulkheads, they'd assumed that it would have a front impact, and that was what it was protecting against. And so they'd sort of said, oh, no more than X bulkheads um, would ever be filled. But because it had a side impact, more bulkheads filled than they expected. And so then it, it tipped too much. Um, and that was, in particular, was a problem because they didn't actually build the bulkheads all the way to the top. They made an optimization, which was, well, that foot and a half between the top of the bulkhead and the, you know, the, the ceiling. I'm sure water would never go there, so, so we can just, you know, make a materials optimization and a weight optimization and, and not build the bulkheads all the way to the top. And so that meant that once the plan started to fail and the ship started to, to tilt too much, then the water flowed over the bulkheads and it, it completely sank. But that's not actually, the, in my view, the main problem with the Titanic that, that caused the failure. The main problem with it was that it was too big. So it was the, fast, it was the hugest ship in its day. Um, it was four city blocks long, about 882 feet. So it was a huge ship. Um, and that meant that as it was going through an ice field, the, the standard way of dealing with ice fields was that you'd have little lookouts and they'd be looking for icebergs and if they saw an iceberg, they'd say, oh, we need to move the ship, you know, there's an iceberg. And so they had the lookouts, the lookouts saw the iceberg, but because the ship was too big and because it wasn't, it wasn't nimble enough, it couldn't avoid the iceberg. So even though it saw the iceberg, it crashed into the iceberg and there was a, a, a loss of life. And what, I think what this shows really is, you know, you can make these plans, but unexpected things will happen. And that's not a fault with the plan necessarily, it's that it's a fault with your ability to respond. Um, so how many have seen the Hidden Figures film? 
yeah, about yeah, some hands. Everybody else, go see the Hidden Figures film. It's such a great film um, if you're interested in history of space or or history of technology. It's 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 just a great film all round. Um, one of the things in Hidden Figures is that they they do all the, the space calculations by hand, and then they're starting to explore technology for it. And so they bring in, they buy this huge IBM mainframe, and it is huge, so you can see, you know, it takes up a whole room. Um, and they had a problem, which is that this computer was huge and the door was small. So there's this, what you, what you can't see um, in that is that they're looking at this shrink-wrapped computer that's in the hall, and they can't get it out of the hall in, into the room because it's too big. And so what they eventually do is they take a sledgehammer to, to the door and, and then get the computer in, and it's, it's you know, great, great movies. But the, I think the, the important thing about that in terms of planning, it wasn't like the people who designed that building were really stupid, right? They, they didn't anticipate huge mainframes. Well, they couldn't have. That technology hadn't been existed, existed yet. And so what, what, it wasn't a planning failure. It was a problem in, in how you respond and how they responded in that case because it was a movie was they took a sledgehammer and you know the director of the lab took a sledgehammer and it was dramatic and they were able to adapt the plan to the, to the new circumstances and that's really what you need to do. In order to adapt the plan, of course, you need to be getting the feedback. And what we often see as well is, is sort of a, a clinging to perfection. And so we'll say, well, we can't ship until every feature is complete. But what that means is that because you're not shipping, you're not getting the feedback. And so then you don't actually know whether you need to adjust the plan or not, because the inputs to adjust the plan aren't coming in. So you know, if you were driving a car, you would never drive a car like this, because you're not getting the feedback. And you need that feedback to see, well, what's, what's in front of me? Do I need to turn? You know, so and yet we often deliver our software like that. We're not getting the feedback. So with the Mars Explorer, one of the problems with, that they had with it, and they, you know, they thought they'd compensated and they hadn't, was that because Earth is in the way of the controller and Mars was often in the way of the, the satellite, they couldn't see it. And so they had to try and make this decision based on quite a few, quite limited points. So they could only see it about once a month and then they had to try and figure out whether they needed to do a course correction. And so it was partly that lack of feedback because they couldn't actually see where it was that, that was causing the problem. And fundamentally, feedback is really good for, for business. Um, feedback's also really good engineering. But in order to get that feedback, it's not free. Uh, MVP is one of those words that's you know, starting to be a bit overused, but I think the key thing with an MVP is that it's only an MVP if it gives you feedback and it probably will hurt. And the reason it hurts is because you want everything to be perfect when it goes out and you want everything to be complete, but it can't be because if you wait till everything is complete, you're getting your feedback too late. You know, so there's this idea that if you're not embarrassed by your first release, it was too late. You've got to get it out there. You've got to be getting the feedback so that you can do the course correction. And what that means, unfortunately, is you, know, you want to be doing the experiments. And it's not an experiment if it always succeeds. An experiment means that sometimes it's going to fail. And so then in terms of how you think about it, it means it is going to fail some of the time. And so you need to be in your planning and in your business culture, you need to be pre prepared to say, yeah, we tried this. It was horrible. It didn't work. Users hate it. Um, but we fixed it. So going back to the Titanic, um, one of the things that really puzzled them when they, when they found the wreck was that there was no staircase. And they knew there, was, there had been a staircase. They could look at the photos and they could see, you know, there was this huge grand staircase. And so then they couldn't figure out what had happened to the staircase. And they, they thought, oh, well, it's wood. Wood doesn't do so well underwater, or maybe it rotted. But a lot of the other wood was still there. And it was only actually when, um, when James Cameron made the Titanic film that they worked out what had happened to, this, to the staircase, because they, they were able to do, they didn't intend it as a staircase experiment, um, but they were doing an experiment by, by exactly recreating the Titanic complete with um, you know, the, the spec of the stairs. And when they flooded it, what they found was that the staircase, even though it was nailed down, the, 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 the water made the staircase buoyant, and it sort of shot up through the roof of the ship and then floated away. And so then by, by doing that experiment, they were able to then work out what had happened to the, to the staircase. Uh, the, so part of that shows that 
experiments are good, um, but in particular what it shows is weird things will happen. Y if, if users are like staircases, users are going to have weird behavior. They're going to use systems in ways that were never expected. Uh, when, when the phone companies introduced SMS, they thought, well, yeah, this might be useful occasionally, but really people want to talk to each other. And then SMS took off beyond their wildest dreams and everybody stopped talking to each other. And they realized, oh, actually people don't want to talk to each other. They just want to communicate, but they want to communicate in a, in a way that's less intrusive than voice. So what you need to do, because, because these things are going to do things that you don't expect, you need to optimize for recovery. So a really good metric for software development is your mean time to recovery. And so at one extreme, you've got the... the the Phobos, you know, once it was bricked, there was nothing that they could do to fix that thing. At the other end, you know, is the sort of the, you know, the really high functioning cloud application where if there's a problem, it's back in milliseconds and there's no data loss. Probably on the, on the more realistic spectrum in between, you know, we've got, if you have to do a lot of manual handoffs to recover something, if you have to ask for permission to recover it, that's going to take a long time. If, if there's manual intervention by one person, that's better, but it's still going to take a long time. If you get back fast, but you trashed all the data, well, that's not good, but at least you got back fast. And the reason the recoverability matters is because we, you know, there's the technical problems where, oh, something went down, we need to get a, a fix out. But there's also the business problems of, we completely misunderstood what our staircase users wanted. We thought they would stay nailed down and actually they floated away, so we've got we've to do something differently and we've got to do something fast. So in order to be able to recover th to that, you know, you've got to have that speed of delivery, that speed of recoverability, because users are going to be weird. And then that, that really sort of brings me back around to what we were talking about at the beginning as the, of, uh, the goal of the cloud is speed. We want to be getting stuff out faster. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is for us as engineers, it feels really bad when you work on something and it doesn't go out or it doesn't go out for ages and you have to sit in loads of review meetings and you know it's going to take ages and you think I just wrote this I just want it to be used and so if it's not getting used well you know morale so not so good but there's also you know when we when we talk up fast is good for business you know I, I don't want to be sort of oh we're all here about the money and it, but I as a way of articulating the value of what we do, there is business value and financial value in, in being fast to market. And there's business value in knowing more. So I think a lot of us, you know, there's sort of a habit of getting stressed about requirements changes and we sort of think, oh, why couldn't the plan be more fixed? You know, why, why, why is this coming in now? Um, but this is such a good way of thinking about it. A late change in requirements is a competitive advantage. It's not that we got it wrong initially and that's bad. It's that now we're getting it more right and that's really good. So the more feedback we have, the more accurate we're going to be both in our engineering of, you know, does this API do what I think it does? Can the system scale the way I think it, it, it can? And also in terms of what we do for the users, what, what value we can bring to the users. Do the users actually want SMSs? Are the users a bit like staircases? So there was a, a whole bunch of really boring things that we used to have to do before we had the cloud in terms of patching machines, imaging machines. Um, when I started at IBM, you could tell um, the status of a developer by how many laptop or by how many machines they had. So each developer would have one laptop. Some would have two. And then we'd all have sort of a, a huge bank of machines under our desks. So, you know, a new developer would have one machine under their desks. So you could tell the really cool developers because they had like three or four and they had all the monitors. And, it, you know, it made you look really cool, but actually they were a nightmare because you had to patch them, you had to maintain them, you had to keep re-imaging them. And, you know, it, it, it was boring. And so cloud native should be a bit the same as, as you know, so what cloud was for hardware, Cloud native should be for software. Cloud native shouldn't be leading us to do more boring things, and it shouldn't be leading us to do more admin and more manual stuff and more boring stuff. It should be moving us higher up the value chain. So with cloud native, 
I think a, a good point to think, am I doing cloud native, is, well, does this feel good? Am I higher up the value chain? If so, then I've got more cloud native. I'm getting more advantage of the cloud. If not, then, then maybe let's con reconsider. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it. And thank you very much. And safe trips home, everybody. Thank you.